Righteousness shall go before him, and he shall direct his going in the way. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, And let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. So also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, They left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It was early in the morning of May 27th, about an hour or so before the sun was rising, There wasn't a single car on the street, in our our busy street in Philadelphia. I was rushing out the door in a sprint, and I got in my car, I spun it around, I went up the hill to our friends Peter and Morgan's house. Peter and Morgan were also from Charleston, and Peter and I were attending the same seminary in Philadelphia. I was starting to panic because neither of them were answering their phones. Fortunately, they were just a few blocks away, and when I got there, I didn't even parallel park, I just left the car running, and I went up and rang the doorbell, and there was no answer. I saw their car in the driveway, so I I tried to knock on the door, and the door was on the side of the house, and uh, through it was this staircase that went up, and uh, at the end of the staircase was the main door into their upstairs apartment. And Because of this, I, I wasn't super optimistic about them hearing any of my knocks down below, And so what started out as uh, just a polite and gentle knocking so as not to wake the neighbors turned into a ferocious banging, and still it was to no avail. I knew their bedroom was was right above me directly, so I I started shouting, Peter, Morgan, wake up! And at this point, I, I completely stopped caring what the neighbors were thinking, so I started honking my horn and screaming, Peter, Morgan, wake up! I didn't know what to do. They must have been the only ones probably on the entire block who couldn't hear me. So I decided I'm going to have to break in. And right before I did, I I remembered they had a a back porch. And it was a second-story porch that overlooked this playground in the back. So I went around the house and uh, scaled the wall next to the playground and jumped up, grabbed hold of this porch. uh, And I was hanging probably 10 to 12 feet above the ground Thanks to all the adrenaline, I was able to throw my leg up on the side of the porch and I pulled myself up, just in relief to be up there. I remembered that I actually needed to to wake them up, so I started banging on the door, which was directly into their kitchen, and figured, of course, they're going to hear me, but still, yet again, they didn't answer. And I couldn't understand how their two dogs weren't even going nuts at this point. I knew if I could somehow wake up the dogs, then everything would be solved. So right before I was about to just bust down the door, I thought, I remembered, well, they have a a kitchen window. Maybe I can, maybe it's open. And uh, lo and behold, it was. So I lifted it up and I shouted, Peter, wake up. Molly's having a baby. And you see, 
uh, our family, we, we didn't have any family up in Philadelphia. Peter and Morgan were the only ones nearby who could watch our two-year-old at the time while we could go to the hospital. And to my great relief and delight, I heard the, bo- the dogs start barking and Peter comes out in this kind of uh, drowsy stupor and thankfully didn't have a shotgun and he, he says, well, oh my goodness, we'll, we'll be right there, let me get dressed. And they had been the only couple, um, they had only gone to bed apparently just a couple hours before and their rooms had been filled with white noise machines and they didn't hear a single thing. Well, the story ended, we safely got to the hospital, had our child, uh, and Peter and Morgan are actually now uh, our child's godparents, and they were our lifesavers up in Philadelphia. That morning, I had a pressing sense of urgency. I had an earnestness in me that caused me to do things I wouldn't normally do, because I was delivering a message of first importance. And thankfully, because Of the message that I had, the neighbors kind of tolerated some of the more extreme actions that I took. This morning in our epistle lesson, we see the Apostle Paul reminding the church in Corinth about the message he delivered to them, and he calls it a message of first importance. Messages of first importance demand our attention. They they cause us to act with intentionality and decision, and they command all our attention and focus. They will not be ignored. Intentionality, energy, determination, these are words that describe the Apostle Paul's life as a Christian. He would later write to this same church in Corinth and describe his life like this. It was full of imprisonments with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, and cold, and exposure. Such was the life of Paul. And yet, he had this baffling buoyancy inside of him. He would confound people because he had this unshakable joy, even in these circumstances. Well, all the urgency, all the suffering, and all the joy were due to this message of first importance that he had been entrusted with. So this morning, I want us to look at what Paul says about this message of first importance. Really, I just want to answer two simple questions. First, what does Paul say about this message? And then second, what does this message actually do in the lives of those who receive it? So would you look with me at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at the first verse. And let's begin to answer that first question. What does Paul say about this message of first importance? Well, he tells us three things that are vitally important about this message. The first thing he says about it is that it's a gospel. He says, I would now remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. Well, what is a gospel? The word gospel is often one of those words that Christians often use but rarely understand. It comes from the old English, good spell or good news. Paul's message was of first importance because it was good news. It was not advice or moral instruction. It was not some sort of philosophy. It was news. Let me ask you this morning, is that the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the message of Christianity? Good news. So often the church today can spend time on issues that are secondary. In doing so, they completely miss the point of Christianity. This is exactly what Paul thought was happening in the church in Corinth. Their church was torn asunder with division. They were filled with rivalries and factions. They were divided over questions like, what should our worship services services be like? How should we relate to those who look different from us and who are in a different socioeconomic bracket? How should we live in a pluralistic society where everyone seems to do whatever they think is right in their own eyes? My friends, are these not the exact same questions we are asking today? 
Are these questions important? Absolutely they are. Does it matter how the church relates to the state or if we should be concerned with racial reconciliation or what happens in our worship? You bet. These are very important questions and they flow right out of the gospel. And Paul has touched on all of these topics earlier in this very letter. But answer me this, how can we possibly expect to agree on matters of secondary importance when we ignore the matters of first importance? That was Paul's concern. He was worried that the Corinthian church had become so focused on secondary matters that they neglected the primary ones. And in fact, he looks at their behavior and he begins to question whether they really received these foundational principles at all. You see, the problem in the church today is the same problem down through the centuries. All of a sudden, what is heard from pulpits are matters that are downstream of the gospel. Secondary matters begin to eclipse primary ones. The gospel gets confused with matters of secondary importance. And eventually the result is always the same. The church curves in on itself. It begins to talk about man instead of God. It begins to focus on itself and it loses sight of the good news. And the church is left in in disarray. But more than that, the outside world is left wondering if the church is anything more than a, a social club or some philanthropic association. Paul's message of first importance is a gospel. It's good news. And the second thing he says about this message is it has to do with its source. Where did Paul get this message from? He emphatically says that he did not make it up. It didn't come from him. Rather, in verse 3, he says that I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received. Well, where did Paul receive this good news? Who was it that, that gave it to him? It came from none other than God himself. The book of Acts tells us that Paul had encountered the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it was he who entrusted him with this message. So Paul's message of first importance, it's important because it comes directly from God. The Apostle Peter affirms this same thing in his second letter when he says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Sometimes the church can neglect this message of first importance because it seems too fanciful to be true. It's not uncommon, especially in the last century, to find even leaders in the church reciting the creed with their fingers crossed behind their backs. They believe all this business about a a virgin conceiving and giving birth and a, a man from Nazareth who went around healing people and Jesus rising from the dead. All of this is folklore. It's Nice stories that were maybe made up by his followers. But if you actually read Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, you'll begin to notice a couple things. These followers of Jesus were largely uneducated. And also, all the accounts that we have of Jesus include specific details and names so that what was said could be verified or falsified. They weren't written as feel-good stories of fiction. But perhaps the strongest bit of evidence that this message was not invented by men was the change that happened in the disciples themselves. You see, this ragtag group of disciples who were so often getting things wrong about Jesus and who were so afraid before His resurrection, suddenly after it are transformed into courageous folks who would die all, each of them, a martyr's death. Let me ask you this morning, would you go all the way to your own martyr's death if you knew you were making it up? And yet that's exactly what each of them do. Not one of them budging or recanting. This message of Paul, this message of first important, it's timeless because it comes from a timeless God. It's unchanging because it comes from an unchanging God. And it's of first importance because it comes from God. So Paul says that this message is a gospel. It's good news. That's the nature of it. And secondly, the source is none other than God Himself. It's good news from God to men. But thirdly, what's its content? That's the third thing Paul says about this message. He says, 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ. We see this message as a message about Christ. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. It meant the anointed one, the king, the rescuer. It's the most often used title for Jesus. Jesus the Christ is the center of this message of first importance. But what was it about Jesus that Paul considered to be of first importance? My friends, this is where so many people go astray. They consider the most important thing about Jesus to be His his teaching. How He taught others to love and, and to forgive. But what does Paul say was the most important thing about Jesus? He says that He died. He was buried. He was raised. And He appeared. Paul's message of first importance was not Jesus' teaching. He doesn't even mention Jesus' teaching here. Why? Was Jesus' teaching not important? Well, of course it was important. But it was not of first importance. Because fundamentally, Jesus' ethical teaching was not good news. Read through Jesus' teaching and tell me, how do you feel? Do you feel inspired? Maybe, perhaps. But go and try and live as He says, and you'll very quickly realize, if you're honest, that you are cut to the quick and unable to even lift up your head. When people seem surprised at the division and selfishness in the world, when they think the answer is so simple, well, just, what would Jesus do? When they are confused why others aren't acting in a loving way, it shows me that they know nothing of their own heart that they have not taken an honest look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and actually tried to live according to it. Because anyone who's really tried to follow Jesus' teaching, they will tell you that it only leads you face down in the dirt. What does Paul say about Jesus that is good news of first importance? It wasn't His teaching, it was what He did. That He died, that He was buried, that He was raised, and that He appeared. He doesn't talk about the teaching. He talks about what He did. He talks about events. He talks about facts. That's the good news. We can even condense the entire Christian message to just these two events, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, the burial only underscored that Jesus really died. And His appearance only underscored that He really was raised. The death and resurrection are the good news of Christianity They are the events that are foundational to the faith. They are never something that we move beyond or leave behind. The entire Christian life is built upon these things. And as our bulletin says in the inside cover each week, those who are spiritually weary, those who mourn, those who struggle, those who are lonely and strangers, those who see that they are sinners who are stuck and unable to help themselves, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the most sublime, the most satisfying news they've ever heard. But Paul says at the beginning of the first letter to the Corinthians that this simple gospel message, it was foolishness to the Greeks. The Greeks, they valued rhetoric and logic. They loved great oratory and they wanted some grand philosophy. They loved brilliant minds and they found Paul's unpolished speech and simple message of a crucified and risen Jesus to be utter folly. And on the opposite extreme, Paul says that the Jews who longed for a Messiah who was going to come and and bring this people and restore them back mightily, they found this gospel message a stumbling block. Their Messiah was supposed to be some conquering king, not a suffering servant. And it tripped them up that this Messiah would die on a cursed tree. But what the Jews and the Greeks both had in common was this. They thought too highly of themselves. They didn't see their true need. They didn't see that they were estranged from God. They didn't see they were in rebellion against Him. And that because they chose to reject Him, that they were now under God's righteous judgment and wrath against sin. They had gone their own way. Both the Greeks and the Jews couldn't see that they were completely unable to make themselves right with God. My friends, how do you view this simple message this morning? Is it foolishness to you? Do you long for something more positive or optimistic? Or is this message perhaps a stumbling block to you? Is it a hindrance 
that the founder of Christianity is a suffering servant who promises that those who follow Him will also suffer? Or is this Gospel of Jesus Christ that He died and was raised, is it the most wonderful thing you've ever heard? Is it the pearl of infinite value to you? Is it the thing that you cannot live without? Is it a message of first importance to you? If it isn't, then I I plead with you right now to consider who you really are. See yourself rightly as God sees you. See that your predicament is so much more dire than you realize. That there's no amount of effort or striving that can get you out of the muck that you are in. There is no ladder long enough whereby you could climb out. But oh my friends, God has seen you. He sees you and He has done something about it. He has come down, He died, and He rose again. And He doesn't throw you a ladder. He comes down Himself and carries you out. Oh my friends, what good news this is. That's what it means to be a Christian. Let me close by answering the second question I posed. What does this message actually do for those who receive it? Well, as you would imagine, it brings unspeakable joy. A joy that never goes away. Think of the joy of a man who has been stranded out at sea for weeks when he finally sees the rescue helicopters coming his way. Think of the the love and the gratitude that an unfaithful wife has when she is stunned into silence by these words of her husband, I forgive you. I love you. I remain committed to you. The Old Testament book of Hosea says that's exactly what our relationship with God is pictured like. But in addition, in addition to joy and love and gratitude, I want us to look at what this message did in the Apostle Paul's own life. He tells us in verses 9-11 through 11 that this gospel of grace brought both radical humility and resurrection power here and now. He says in verse 9 that I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, for I persecuted the church of God. Paul is aware that before he uh, encountered the risen Jesus, that he captured and imprisoned Christians. He, He never gets over that. He was humbled by how much of a sinner he was. But even after he became a Christian, he still described himself as the chief of sinners. You see, the gospel produces in everyone who truly receives it a deep and lasting humility. Men and women who receive the gospel have finally come to their senses. They see themselves as they truly are. And this kind of radical humility changes your life. In every relationship, if somebody has wronged you, you're able to see yourself even in the worst of their actions. It was the New England Puritan Jonathan Edwards who, at the age of 19, wrote a list of 70 resolutions that would lead him uh, to living a full life. And the eighth one goes like this. He says, Resolved in all my speech and actions to think of myself as if nobody had been so vile as myself. And to let the failings of others only be an occasion for confessing my own sins and misery to God. Can you imagine the harmony that we would have in the world if you and I actually lived this way in our friendships, in our marriage, in our parenting? If we had this humility that the gospel brings with it, if it was applied to every area of our lives? Imagine the patience and the compassion if we stopped and actually thought about this. You'd be able to truly speak the truth in love. It was the English reformer John Bradford who first uttered that famous phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. Such humility belongs to every true Christian, for they can see even in the worst sins of others the root of that same sin in themselves. And I would submit to you that this kind of radical humility is just what our society needs today. And it's the first thing that this message of first importance brings to those who receive it. But radical humility isn't the only thing that the gospel brings about in Paul's life. He says in verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace towards me was not in vain. The word in vain, it means being empty or having no effect. The gospel, it produced something in Paul's life. It wasn't 
empty. You see, every time someone receives this message, a little miracle, a little resurrection happens inside. And the person is made a new creature. He has a new power, a new life. The same power that raised Jesus up from the dead is at work in Him. Paul says that this power caused him to work harder than any of the other apostles. I knew college coaches who would be afraid if their players became Christians. They feared that they would not be as motivated by their coaching anymore and they'd become lax. And while it's true that Christians are not as motivated by fear-mongering and shame, it is utterly false to think that Christians become less hard-working. Just the contrary, Paul says. The Gospel spurs believers on to strive with all their might, and their motivation is far more powerful. It's not fear. It's love. Do you lack motivation in in your work? The message of the Gospel brings with it a dynamism that surpasses all others. Even the smallest, most minute details of your life God cares about. And His grace produces a resurrection life in you that will cause you to work as hard as you can. But this power is not from yourself. It's from God. It's all His grace. Gracious power to endure all hardship. Power to work and rest no matter the results. Power to fight and conquer sin in your own life. And power on the last day to rise again as Jesus did when this resurrection seed grows to maturity. My friends, have you received this message of first importance this morning? Is it what you're standing on? Are you holding fast to it? This message has always been a stumbling block and foolishness to many, but to those who are called, to those who receive it, it is the power and wisdom of God. May it be so with you this morning. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. 